schedule so that I don't have to introduce myself since my boss just talked. Um, <laughs> um, um, Dr. Quaid's lab, we focus mostly on skin and soft tissue injuries down at Emory. So today I'm going to talk about um, an ongoing project that's actually getting a lot of attention this summer in our lab. So this is very preliminary work on a St. John's port um, oleate preparation that was used traditionally for the treatment of uh, wounds. Um, this is a hypericum perforatum extract, and I think most people in this audience are familiar with St. John's wort. It's a perennial, herbaceous plant, it's about this tall, makes these, there's a point around here somewhere. Um, uh, beautiful yellow flowers. Um, just as your little trivia bit here in Europe, apparently it flowers around June 24th, which is celebrated in the Catholic Church as the birthday of St. John. And that's where the St. John's part of St. John's work comes from. So it has this kind of Christian linkage. You'll see that a couple times in this presentation, um, going with the, we'll call it Pope or the plant. Its range is fairly pan um, uh, I'm not looking for everywhere but the tropics and the Arctic. So um, the original species range is in Europe, but it has been taken everywhere in the world. You can see in the US that. It's found in almost all 50 states and most of Canada. It's considered invasive in almost all of those places, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, but it has a rich medicinal history because it's found in so many places. So I was saying it has this long history of use. This is a, a page from uh, Discordes Materia Medica. So this is first century CE. Um, a nice picture of it up here. If you can read Latin, feel free. Go ahead and read the whole text. For the rest of us, um, the highlights are that it was used as a diuretic. Um, it would be used to begin the menstrual flow if there were some issues with that. Um, the treatment of fevers, um, short-term fevers, so probably not long chronic illness, uh, more like cold flu symptoms. They would make a decoction of the seed to treat sciatica, and they would use the leaves also as a decoction, sometimes adding in the seeds to treat and heal burns. You'll notice nowhere in this list do we see what's probably the one thought in everybody's head? Oh, St. John's Ward, it treats depression. Um, that doesn't happen until around the 1500s. This is a Swiss physician named Periclesis, and uh, he begins prescribing this to his patients that um, have what he calls mood disorders and describes St. John's Ward in his notes as an arnica for the nerves. Um, so really, a, kind of a late introduction to the activity that we think of um, first and foremost for this plant. Um, this is you know, well documented. There's, I mean, this is an article from Newsway a week a couple years ago all about it. Um, this is from the Daily Mail. There have been multiple clinical trials over varying dosages, all showing therapeutic effects in John's work with depression. It's been standardized by the Commission E and in Europe. You can actually get it as a prescription, um, and they have a standardized extract uh, to several of the high perforant um, hypericin concentrations. Of course, in the United States, we all know this is regulated as a dietary supplement, and therefore there is no dosing recommendation, but I guess feel free to use yours. Um, just as a little side note, this is one of those examples of all things natural are not safe. Um, it has many documented interactions with other antidepressants and blood thinners as well as other prescription drugs. So just like any other herb, it actually is a medicine and needs to be treated with the same respect as any other prescription drug. So we made it up to the 1500s. Um, we don't see the type of preparation that we're interested in or that's being studied in this project until around 1830. This is a, a paper from um, uh, Culper in the British Herbal and Family Physician. And he talks about making the whole plant into an ointment to treat obstructions, um, swellings, and to dissolve the lips of wounds. This is the first record that I could find where we see this fat or oil preparation of St. John's Ward. Everything else has been um, basically a water or a um, a poultice that's applied fresh. Um, so it's kind of a late introduction, but it was identified through interviews in the Balkans by Dr. Quay back in 2014 in one of her research projects as a traditional Balkan folk med medicine. So it may predate, you know, have a timeline to go with this. And they use it there for um, wounds, ulcers, and skin inflammations. And this is a picture of some of the homemade St. John's Ford extract. The way this is produced there is they take a bottle, they stuff the bottle full of as many flowers as they possibly can, they fill that bottle up with olive oil or sunflower oil, 
and then they stick it on the roof of their house or somewhere else in the sunshine, and they leave it for 40 days. Again, 40 days, another Christian um, number, so you get that linkage back to Christianity with this plant. Um, after 40 days, it takes on this very bright red color. They filter out the flowers, they store it, this is an old soda bottle or any other container, and then they use it to apply the you know, skin wounds and to treat, to treat uh, injury. So it has a pretty strong history here. Um, you know, St. John's Wort has a pretty strong history all throughout, you know, back to the first century. That is not the button I needed to press. Um, but does it actually work for skin and soft tissue injuries? Well, there's a study back in 2010, uh, this is not our group, um, that worked on a Turkish um, oleate preparation of St. John's Wort that's very similar, that it's produced almost exactly the same, a little shorter um, duration in making it. Um, and they did some animal models on this. The first one involved um, putting a five centimeter incision in a mouse and then putting three sutures in it. And then they treated that incision with one of three things, either nothing, just the olive oil, or this foliate extract of St. John's wort. And if you look after a period of days, they went and measured, um, they anesthetized the mouse, and then they literally tore the, the sutures back open, or the wound back open, and measured how hard it was to open. So the more force it takes to open that wound, the more healed the wound has been. Um, you see a significant increase in the amount of force, uh, 40 to over to almost 70 um, to open that. The other test that they did in this was that they, they took um, essentially a punch biopsy of the mouse, so a two centimeter circle, they took out the skin, and then over the course of three weeks, and that's probably a little big, that is not to scale, luckily. Um, but, um, over the course of three weeks, they treated the mice twice a day with either nothing, olive oil, or the St. John's wort extract. Again, you oops, um, get down to the bottom, you can see you're looking at it at four millimeters, four square millimeters with the St. John's wort compared to 70 or 23 with the other treatments. So basically, it's completely healed after three weeks versus still having a noticeable wound. So we have a traditional remedy. Um, it seems to have activity both through the traditional literature and through some recent mouse models. Um, and being the natural product chemist in the group, I have to ask, okay, what's what's causing this? What are the chemicals? And the first two that pop into your head when you talk about St. John's Wort are hypericin and hyperforin. So hypericin is this natural diantum. Um, it has this just super cool flat structure. It's very, very stable. It's actually a pre hypericin that's present in the plant, but by the time you do the abstract, you get to drying the material. It's almost all converted to this very stable structure. And this is what's responsible for giving you this beautiful red color in St. John's Wort that you see. Um, these are actually the samples that we worked with that were purchased over in uh, some of the markets in the Balkans. It's also the compound that causes the photosensitivity. So if you take St. John's Wort for any period of time, you get the warning, don't go out in the sunshine, um, we get rid of that sunburn, you can develop blisters, or even animals that graze on St. John's Wharf for too long and can develop photosensitivity and cause serious skin problems. Um, the compound occurs in basically all the above ground parts. Hyperferin is the other one. This is its crinolated fluorofrucanol. It has um, these four isoprenol chains hanging off, and this is the one here that's been modified, so it's, it's also this has just fantastic structures in it. Um, the chemistry is really interesting. Um, but because of all these side chains sticking off, it's very UV unstable. Um, so the fact that we have an extract being made by leaving the sunshine gets really interesting. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but this compound occurs mainly in flowers and reproductive tissue, and it's what's considered the most active of the antidepressant compounds. Its activity is still a little in debate, but it most likely works for inhibiting several um, neurotransmitter reuptake channels. Um, it also has been shown to have very antibacterial activity, um, specifically against MRSA and staph, as well as several other bacteria, but for us, MRSA and staph were the, were the good ones to hear. So we have some potential chemistry, we have a traditional remedy, um, we have some animal models showing it's active. What do we want to do? Well, we want to take a look at this and see if any of these compounds are present. The hypothesis is there's probably not a whole lot of piperacin in this um, because people are rubbing it all over their arms and their legs when they have a cut and they're not blistering. That's a good thing. Um, but it still has this nice red color, so there's probably a little some of it in there. And then we also have hyperferin, which is not UV stable, so they're sticking it in the sunshine for 40 days. All of that should have been degraded. Um, 
In order to investigate this, we had collections from the field of St. John's wort, dry ground. We did a, a extraction using a sonicator with methanol and water, concentrated those down, lyophilized them, and used these as our laboratory control samples. So we had a methanol and an aqueous extract of St. John's wort. Also, several um, of these oleate preparations were purchased at various markets and various different vendors, as well as being provided by people giving the information, and those were used to test. We kind of lucked out on this and were able to, after a whole bunch of other trials, use the easiest possible method. Um, we took the oleate and diluted it down with a little ethyl acetate and could do a direct injection onto the LCMS and compare it using the exact same methodology as the methanol water, which is great because getting rid of the oil from the plant sample is never an easy thing. Um, taking a look at the LCMS data, what we have here is the base peak chromatogram. You have the macerated oil on top. This is the methanol made laboratory sample and the water extracted laboratory sample. Time across the bottom, relative intensity going up this scale. First thing and only thing you see labeled here is the hyperferrin. So hyperferrin was found in the oleate and there is not actually a peak here in the methanol. It's missing and there's definitely not a peak in the water. This is not surprising in the laboratory made samples. We did not really take any extra special care to keep uh, UV light away from those samples. They spent a couple of minutes in the sonicator repeatedly, got filtered, dried down, and on the road about. We spent the better part of the day in the sunlight. And that is consistent with the degradation of hyperferrin. It's very quick, it's very rapid, and it's very complete. What is really interesting is after 40 days, and this is just a representative sample, we ran several of these oils, they all show hyperferrin in them. So we have a compound that degrades on my bench in a day, showing up after over a month of sitting in the sunshine outside in a traditional remedy. So something in this traditional remedy is stabilizing a highly unstable compound. And this state unstable compound is antibacterial. So we have a traditional remedy doing some really cool chemistry in order to do some really cool wind healing. The other thing you'll notice is that we don't have hyper, um, sorry, hypericin indicated anywhere in that. Um, again, that's not surprising in the macerated oil. Um, we, um, we don't want to see it. We don't want to see the photosensitivity. So again, the traditional remedy and the chemistry are kind of lying well. What's a little problematic here is we don't see it in the methanol or water samples either. Um, this method, it should show up somewhere right around here. Um, we've got some standards on order. Like I said, this is an ongoing project. We're going to run some spiking experiments and verify that the methodology is working properly. And we also have some uh, other extracts that were made outside of our lab that we're going to run to verify that this method works. But it's an adaptation of a, a published method, so it should be right there. Um, I'm fairly confident that it's just missing from our sample for some reason. So, I guess in conclusion of an ongoing project, um, hyperferrin is present in the oil, so we have an antibacterial compound that's UV unstable, it's being stabilized. The hypericin wasn't really detected in any sort of abundant in any sort of abundance, so again, no photosensitivity. Um, and what we need to do next, of course, is figure out what's going on with the hypericin, do some spiking experiments, find some other extracts, um, and verify that it really is lacking. We'd like to do some sort of orthogonal technique to validate what we see here in the mass spec. And um, obviously the extract is red, and the most common compound is hypericin, so I'd really like to know which one is causing the right color. There are other derivatives that it's possible, we'll go look for them. And um, this mechanism of UV stabilization is, is just fascinating that we have something as simple as sunflower oil or olive oil and that can stabilize a highly unstable compound. There, there's a story to be told here that um, we're really going to hammer this summer and hopefully be able to you know, present that maybe at the next one of these <laughs> and talk about this mechanism of stabilization. So with that, I need to thank all the um, undergraduates and other researchers in Dr. Quaid's group, of course our funding source at the NIH, and the local communities in Italy and Kosovo that were responsible for providing the information, actually the raw material, and the finished product on this one. So um, all I did was get to run their samples and talk about their story. So thank you all for listening, and what are your questions?